Welcome to the Talking the Talk podcast, where we'll be exploring items of automotive technology and their journey into mass production. I'm Kevin Reed, the founder of Ireland Made, where we celebrate stories of Irish transport past and present, and this is our podcast. I'm delighted to welcome my co-host, automotive engineering consultant, Mike Keane. Mike's consultancy delivers bespoke and sustainable transport solutions, and previously Mike has led vehicle development programs for Ford, Williams Formula One Advanced Engineering, Nissan, Jaguar, Land Rover, and Aston Martin. Mike has also worked on projects as diverse as hybrid supercars to off-road electric vehicles. But what is most impressive for me, Mike worked on the James Bond movie Spectre, and he worked on the baddies car, the Jaguar CX-75. In each episode, we're going to be examining vehicles that range from the 1921 German Rumpfler right up to what Tesla and Lucid are doing today. In this episode, we're exploring the history of body systems. Hello, Mike. Hi, Kev. How are you doing? Oh, very well. So the story of body systems, what can you tell us? Yep. So the story of body systems, we're going to talk about three different things, um, which are all interrelated. So we're going to talk about the shape of the car, the assembly method, and the materials that were used. In many of our conversations, we've often talked about how there are similarities with how cars are engineered today and how they had been previously engineered. And we're going to see with body systems that there's one particular construction approach that's come full circle. And it's an assembly principle that electric cars use today. And it was almost almost entirely discounted for road cars in the 1960s. Excellent. So talking about the shape, in our styling episode, we previously spoke about market segmentation and how designers try to create something new that's appealing. And in the Trendsetters episode, we talked about cars like the Renault Espace and the Ford Mustang introducing brand new segments. Yeah, that's right. So the designers, they've always tried to create new body styles, but they always try to create new body types as well. So fashions and trends change so which body types are popular at any one time changes but even from one country to the next we would see that certain body types are more popular so an example of that would be in the early or in the 2000s and in the 2010s in the d segment so the cars which would be the size of a ford mondeo for instance the saloon or the sedan style was very popular in the usa or in the UK or here in Ireland, whilst in continental Europe, estate cars were far more popular. And then today, crossovers and SUVs and MPVs, they're easily the most popular styles globally. But really, all of the body types are variations on four different types. So the sedan or the saloon, the hatchback, the station wagon, and the convertible. Okay, so let's start with the sedan or the saloon as we'd know it here in Ireland or England. Yeah, that's right. So 1899, the Renault Voiturette Type B. So that was the first car that had a fixed roof as opposed to a um, foldable pram type roof. Hmm. Slightly strange looking thing. It looked a little bit like a telephone box on wheels because it was a two-seater car. Now, we generally consider a sedan to be at least a four-seater so the first true sedan was in 1911, and it was a, uh, an American car called a Speedwell. Speedwell, right. So when were station wagon and hatchback body types introduced? So a little bit later. So the, the first station wagons were actually options that were offered by coach builders. You know, we talked about coach builders in the styling episode, um, mm. and they offered station wagon options on the Ford Model T chassis. The first manufacturer to offer a station wagon from the production line was the American company Star in 1923. And then if we look at hatchback, the first hatchback was the 1938 Citroen 11, or the Traction Avant as it's known. This is a, a very innovative car. So it's a, a lot of production first. So first hatchback, first double wishbone suspension, first torsion bar suspension. We'll talk about both of those in two episodes time in, on suspension. The first high volume front wheel drive um, car and the first unibody, which we'll come back to later today. So what about other styles like the coupe or the multi-purpose vehicle, the MPV or the sports utility vehicle, the SUV? Yeah, the, the coupe, the notchback, the fastback, they're actually just variations on the sedan or on the hatchback. And indeed they're often built on a, on a common platform and MPVs, SUVs or crossovers 
their variations on the station wagon. Okay, so in our previous trendsetter episode, we talked about the Ford Mustang pony car being derived itself from sedans. Yeah, yeah, good example. So there's always a push to use, by the, a push by the manufacturers to use components from other models from within the family of cars. Um, it saves money in multiple multiple ways, right? So the design and development phase is reduced, it just takes less time. The production lines can create more parts using less tooling because they have to create fewer types of tooling mm -hmm. and increasing the volumes of supplied component orders with external companies means that manufacturers can get economies of scale. So they just save money all around. The Ford Model T, you know, Kevin, you like you and I come up against the Ford Model T over and over again in these conversations, right? The examples, yes, absolutely, it's fun at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just the, the grandfather, right? So it was a, it's an ex excellent example of this because on the on the production line, they made sedans, touring cars, station wagons, trucks, or runabouts. Uh, was a, a type of sporty car that they they had in the twenties, all built on the same production line using interchangeable parts. Now, typically. Components are interchangeable, but the chassis and the body type or the body were unique for each model. And then increasingly as car development went on through the last hundred years, and particularly with the advent of computer-aided design in the 80s, manufacturers were able to standardize higher percentages of the car. So the ideal scenario for a manufacturer is to create multiple body styles or body types on a single platform. And the Volkswagen Group is particularly adept at this. So their A platform, as they call it, it carries over 20 vehicle models. So you've got cars like the Golf, the Sirocco, the Audi TT, the Seat Leon. So they're all on a, on a common platform. And also many of those models have different body types. So the Golf, you could see the Golf in a, in a hatchback or in, or in an estate, for instance. That's incredible. 20 different models from the one platform. Mm. So obvious question, what's a platform? Yeah, so platform, it's, it's quite a generic term, actually, and, and it's actually been used to mean different things. So for a long time, it just referred to the running chassis. And then as cars begin to be manufactured using unibody or monocoque construction, the platform came to mean a layout whereby the powertrain and the chassis components were common, but also their relative position in the car was common. Right. So what do we mean by chassis or chassis? Yeah, chassis or chassis. So um, I like your, your, your wording there. So ch chassis, it's a French word. And it's been, and, you know, so it started as chassis and now it's been incorporated into English as chassis. Um, cars had a separate chassis from the very start because that's how horse-drawn carriages were built. So the chassis is a structure onto which various components and systems are mounted. The first cars use wooden chassis, but very quickly steel was adopted for its its strength and its durability and then typically the first cars had what's called a ladder chassis it's called that because it actually looks a little bit like a ladder so you've got two very strong beams running along the side with multiple lateral cross members added for stiffness and then onto that chassis would be added the suspension and the brakes and the steering and then the engine and the transmission and the wheels and at that stage of the build before the body had been added you could actually drive that chassis around. So hence they were called running chassis. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, then the body was added. And that construction method, it's often now called body on frame. Um, and that's where you have a separate chassis. And then that, that method of using a separate chassis, that was universal right up to the 1950s. Right. So I, I'm immediately thinking of my 1971 Land Rover Series 3. Great example. Very strong ladder chassis with lightweight aluminium body panels. Yeah, great example. Uh, actually, a particularly good example because a ladder chassis is very well suited to 4x4 applications. And it's still used in 4x4 applications today. So new trucks like the Ford Ranger, or the Nissan Navara, they still use a, a, a ladder chassis assembly method. Why do they still use that method? Um, it's, it's down to what it's, it's, it's both the major advantage and the major disadvantage of a separate chassis, depending on what your application is. So an independent chassis sits on a geometric, more or less a single plane. So, you know, you could, you could place that frame on the floor and it's a flat frame effectively. And because it's relatively flat, there's very little vertical structure in it. So although they're strong, it has relatively poor torsional rigidity. 
So torsion rigidity is the ability for the chassis to resist twisting. So if you imagine that uh, the front left hand wheel it goes over a bump and the rear right hand wheel goes over a bump, they're putting a twisting moment through the chassis. Yeah. So because there's no vertical structure, it's not able to resist that. And that's actually a good thing on a four by four, because if you're taking four by four, you know, well off road over very rough terrain, that um, flexibility in the chassis helps with the compliance over those bumps. It helps to absorb that rough, um, that rough terrain. However, on a road vehicle, ideally the chassis should be really stiff or stiff as possible and allow the suspension system to do, to take up that compliance, allow the suspension system to handle the bumps because in that case, if the chassis is twisting, it means that the position of the wheels, the relative position of the wheels has not been controlled very well. That's, you know, it's much more difficult to control the relative position of the wheels. Right then. So, so how did road cars having a separate chassis, how did they actually cope? It was always a problem. The, the main method at first was simply to try and make the steel sections of the chassis thicker and have larger cross sections and basically just try to resist those forces simply by, you know, through the material strength. Yeah. But the problem with that is it adds material to it, adds mass into the, into the car. So it's a, you know, it's a limited solution. Often body and frame cars would, would suffer from twisting and it resulted in poor road holding or even noises and squeaks, right? So the various components on the car would be rubbing against each other as the chassis twisted. And in open top cars where there's no roof, and you don't have that extra support from the roof, it's a, there's a phenomenon called scuttle shake. And that's where in that central portion where the occupants are, you know, there's the least amount of structure and therefore it, uh, there's a, a possibility of the car flexing in the middle. British sport cars of the 60s, like the, the Austin Healy 3000 and the, the MGB, they were particularly prone to that. Right. So I've heard of scuttle shape, but I've not actually been in a car and experienced it. Like, is it visible to the naked eye? Can I feel it through the seat? Can I see it on the, on the doors? In, in worst cases, all of those. And so in worst cases, you actually feel it come up through the seat. You can feel that the car is difficult to place on the road. It doesn't always do what you want. And also exactly you say, you would see the doors move in the car. You'd see, you'd see like the gaps changing in the door if, on, on a really, really poor car. Yeah. So it's a, 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 if it's really poorly engineered, you can get all of those problems. Are very reassuring when you're driving <laughs> along. <laughs> so what other types of chassis beside the, uh, the, the ladder frame? Yeah, there's a, a number of different types of independent chassis, but they all had this problem, this torsion rigidity problem that they had to deal with. So the Volkswagen Beetle, that had a pressed steel platform chassis. Again, another use of the word platform. Yeah. Um, and in that pressing, there's a central spine, and that central spine is offering vertical structure to try to deal with the, the torsional um, rigidity problem. The, the, the Renault 4 of 61, of 1961 that also had a press steel chassis and it used a perimeter beam for stiffness a little bit like the the, the, the beams around the outside of the ladder chassis yeah. then there's a a backbone chassis so the rover 8 of 1904 that was the first car to have a backbone chassis it was also on the tatra 11 you remember we we spoke about the tatra 11 on the cooling episode uh, to the teardrop car yeah uh, actually the car before the teardrop car actually the earlier one yeah that's right um and in that case, there's a large steel fabricated tube that runs up the center of the car and it has sort of lightweight steel outriggers that pick up the body and suspension. And then that central tube is trying to do that, uh, offer that stiffness. And it's quite high, so the occupants sit either side of it. Um, if you look at Lotus, so Colin Chapman, he always plays particular importance on chassis stiffness and on vehicle weight. And as a result, Lotus cars have always been famous for their, their vehicle dynamics performance, even today. And many of the earlier Lotuses used a backbone chassis. So Chapman used that on the 1964 Elan, the 66 Europa, the 76 Esprit, and even on the, the DeLorean in 1982, because that was derived from the 76 Esprit. All right. I never knew it came from the 76 Esprit. There you go. Live and learn. Are there any other types of chassis? I think uh, the other most common type of independent chassis was the space frame. So it's predominantly seen in motorsport, um, but it was also, it has all, often been used on high-performance road cars. 
So a space frame, it's a, it's a commonly used method of providing a, a lightweight supporting structure in, in many different engineering applications. So if you think of a, a large tower crane, for instance, or a ship to shore mm -hmm. container crane, you know, they're made up of a crisscross of, of a crisscross pattern of steel beams. So that's a space frame. Mm -hmm. In car terms, the chassis, the space frame chassis is a network of steel tubes that more or less follows the contours of the body. And then onto that or into that, um, that network of tubes, the engine, the suspension components, and the body panels themselves, they're fitted. Um, the first car with a space frame was way back in 1932, it was a Scarab Scout. And then, as I said, it was kind of generally high-performance cars after that. All this, right. And it's just, just as to the Scarab Scout, was that an American car? Yeah, it was. Yeah, the Scarab Scout was, in, was an American car. Um, the space frame, it allows the chassis to have more vertical structure because you're able to build that uh, that network of tubes up higher in the car. But yeah. they still often have that same problem where the door openings are the, the, the weaker the weaker point or the weakness in the structure. OK, so how did engineers solve that problem? If a feeling you're going to tell me a great example. Yeah. Um, so the 1955 Mercedes Benz 300 SL Gullwing. So that car is absolutely iconic because of its Gullwing opening doors. And the gullwing doors were actually a solution for that torsional rigidity problem. So the 300 SL had a space frame chassis. In order to generate enough chassis stiffness in that central portion where the occupants are, the space frame structure needed to be quite high in the sills. And because it was quite high, it just didn't allow for a conventionally opening door. And as a result, the gullwing doors were the solution. Ah, right. It's for the hell of a car, though. It looks fantastic. And all you think of is the Gullwing doors. You don't think of that. No, right. Yeah, that's, the, that's the iconic bit, isn't it? Isn't it just? So going back earlier in this episode, you mentioned unibody. Mm. Yeah. OK, so separate chassis, simple and cheap to make. Right. So, um, you know, simple structure, simple materials, but difficult, as we said, to make them stiff and also difficult to make them light because you tend to get more material added onto them. So in the 1930s, engineers started to look at means to combine the chassis and the body. And nowadays, aside really from the 4x4s that we talked about, very few road cars are made using a separate chassis. And now they're made using what's called a unibody. Right. So you help me out here. A unibody and a monocoque, they're the same thing, right? Aha, uh -huh. no, they're not. Uh, so you, you set me up for a, for a great answer, right? So um, they're often used interchangeably, those terms. So people, in fact, most people talk about cars today being monocoques, and they're actually not monocoques. Um, it's, it's a bit of a technicality, the difference between them, but, but most cars today are all unibodies. So um, they have a similar assembly technique, so monocoques and unibodies. The difference is due to which components are taking the structural load. So neither a unibody nor a monocoque has a separate chassis. In the unibody, the body structure, the floor pan, the window pillars, the roof, and the engine bay, they're all fabric fabricated together in what's called the, the body in white. It's a single, almost like a single component that looks a little bit like a car. And then onto that, then you have the chassis systems are bolted, you have the, the powertrain is added in, and the the body panels like the bonnet and the wings they're added onto that so the body has to take all of the the forces that come from the road and those those applied forces and the load paths they take they're reacted and you know they're taken by the body structure torsional loads we talk about that torsional rigidity so where you know your front left wheel and your rear right wheel are, are you know trying to twist the, the the car that torsional load is passed through the floor and it's also passed through the pillars and through the roof and it's nice and, and torsionally stiff. And then onto that unibody structure, the body panels are added on, but they don't take any of that load. They're just lightweight panels bolted on. A monocoque is exactly the same structure, except the panels, the doors, the bonnet, the wings, they also take some of that structural load. They're stressed panels. So if you take them away from the car, the car is a little bit weaker when those panels are removed. And that's far less common. Right. Okay. So the traction event you mentioned earlier was the first unibody. Who actually then, as a manufacturer, uh, picked it up next? Well, well, really, you know, the European and Japanese manufacturers, they moved towards unibody en masse through the 50s and 60s. So it just rapidly was picked up, uh, you know, across all manufacturers. And in the US, separate chassis or body on frame vehicles, that, that assembly method was held for a lot longer. So well into the 70s, into the 80s, and you know, even today, 
you will you will get cars yeah with a a separate or a body on frame of construction if you look at monocoque which is far less common the 1955 Gaz M72, so the Russian car, that was the first true monocoque because its body panels were all stress members. Or another example would be in 57, Lotus again, they released the Elite and that had a fiber ga- fiberglass monocoque. So very light, very stiff, but not very strong and, and quite expensive to repair. All right. So you mentioned fiberglass there. Were there any other materials used? Yeah, right. So we talked about steel chassis, we talked about steel unibodies and the external panels then that are bolted on were, you know, steel mainly, but sometimes fiberglass, you know, plastics are quite popular now and aluminium would be the other material. Now, aluminium has been used in car construction, but far less extensively. So it's lighter than steel, but steel is stronger and aluminium is expensive to manufacture and it's more difficult to fabricate. So for a long time, it just really wasn't very widely used. We can go right back to 1904. So the Pierce Arrow was the first car that used aluminium castings. And the first car, the the first volume production car to use aluminium body panels was actually the 56 Panhard Dyna, the French car. So it was launched in 56. But interestingly, by 58, they had removed the aluminium panels so that only the bumpers were made in aluminium. Right, because we covered those particular cars, and in fact, the full range of them on a photo shoot for Ireland made down in County Limerick. And I remember hearing that the, the car was designed with aluminium panels in mind, but when they came to manufacture them, they proved to be too expensive. And by 1958, they had stopped using aluminium in the body panels. Yeah. Very, cars, very quirky designs. Lovely, Lovely cars, actually, yeah. So a lot of cars use aluminium. Now, when did they change? Yeah, so 1994, that was really the step change. So the Audi A8, um, it was the first production car to use aluminium uh, for the unibody structure. And Audi used that principle again in 1998 with the A2. So that was the first small production car with an aluminium unibody. And then in between those, in 1996, Lotus released the first generation Elise. And that had a patented extruded and bonded aluminium chassis or tub as it's known on, on in sports cars so had an uh, aluminium tub with fiberglass external panels um, so I, I say tub because many high performance sports cars they have a, a central tub in a lightweight very stiff material and then they have deformable stronger structures at the front and at the rear and those materials that would make up that tub are they carbon fiber sometimes they are actually so carbon fiber you know was developed for cars really in the 1980s so mclaren introduced it to formula one in 1981 and then it was really the 1990s where it's it started being used for road cars so in 91 1991 the jaguar xj15 that was the first carbon fiber monocoque car and then through the 90s then we had the bugatti eb110 ferrari f50 mclaren f1 sports car so all very high-end sports cars um through the next decade it was kind of a handful of cars used carbon fiber. And then for some reason in 2011, there was just a, a rush of carbon fiber structured uh, cars. So in that year, the all of these cars were launched. There was the, the Lamborghini Aventador, the McLaren 12C, the Pagani Huayra, and the Koenigsegg Agera, all released in 2011 with a carbon fiber central tub and with aluminum front and rear subframes. That's quite a stable of cars, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it'd be it'd be a nice garage, wouldn't it? Um, the, the, you see, you have to look at the, the manufacturing process. So carbon fiber, it's, it's very labor intensive, actually. Um, and that makes it very difficult to, to make in high volume. So for Formula One, actually, so Formula One cars use a, a, a manufacturing technique called a hand layup. So it's a it's a hand manufacturing technique. But in 2013, then there were two cars that that challenged whether carbon fiber could be used for high volume as opposed to just these very low volume, high performance cars. So the Alfa Romeo 4C, that had a carbon fiber tub and it was producing higher volume. So they had planned to be able to produce about a thousand a year. I think at the end they produced somewhere around 2000 cars total. The 4C used that same hand layup technique that would be used in Formula One, for instance. And then they just ran multiple production lines in parallel. But the other car that was launched in 2013 uh, with carbon fiber used extensively was the BMW i3. And 
unlike the 4C, that use an expensive uh, volume production process called RTM, so resin transfer molding. And that allowed them to create much higher volumes. And I think 250,000 BMW i3s, i3s were made. Wow. So is that then, is that a carbon fiber unibody? Well, so funnily enough, the i3 has a separate chassis and body, actually. Okay. So the i3 is an electric car. Now, electric cars often incorporate the, the battery into the floor pan. The i3 used a separate aluminium structured chassis, and it, it incorporates the battery, the electric motors, the drive line, and the suspension and the steering systems. And, and they call that the drive model. And effectively, it's a running chassis, as we talked about earlier on. Hmm. And then onto the top of that, they added the separate body, completely separate assembly of the body. And that's made from carbon fiber and from plastic. And they call that the life module. The life module, very catchy. Is that how electric cars are now made? Well, BMW were unique in that the i3 body structure is a completely separate assembly and it's added onto, you know, it's dropped onto the top of the chassis. Most other EVs use a, a really a partial unibody structure. The, the early CVs, they shared their unibodies with uh, combustion engine cars. So the first Tesla, for instance, the 2008 Roadster, that's based on a Lotus Elise aluminium tub. Yeah. In 2012, Tesla launched the Model S and that design placed the battery in the floor. And they refer to that as a skateboard because what they had, it, was, it was similar to the i3. So the, the battery pack is built into a flat structure in the floor and it also holds the drive line and the suspension. But then that skateboard structure, or skateboard as they call it, that structure, it's incorporated into the unibody. And that's the most, that's now sort of the most common construction for EV body structures. But the funny thing is, Manufacturers now tend to refer to that skateboard as the platform. So platform, there you go. Word keeps coming up. Coming around. Lovely. Thank you, Mike. Most interesting and brings us to the end of our exploration on the history of body systems or monocoque, chassis, skateboards, platforms, all brought together as body systems. Join us in episode 10 when we'll be talking about the history of steering systems. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on the Talking the Talk podcast. My thanks to Mike Keane, and you can check out his consultancy on mikekeane.ie. Then check out irelandmade.ie to view our back catalogue of videos celebrating stories of Irish transport, past and present. We look forward to welcoming you on to our next episode where we further explore the origins of automotive technology. You can find us on YouTube or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Please subscribe and tell your friends. Bye for now. Mm-hmm.